Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast. My name is Mike and Davina, and thanks so much for hanging out with me today. Today, my guest is Martin Cook, who is an engineer who has worked with bands such as Death Cab for Cutie, which he had a Grammy nomination with in 2015. He's also worked with bands like Of Monsters and Men, At the Drive-In, Churches, Haim, Kimra, Seawolf, and a whole bunch more. And when Martin was getting started, as you'll hear in his story, he started using a lot of analog gear and then eventually made the switch over to digital. And throughout his switch, and even to this day, he has made a big focus on getting an analog sound in the digital environment. And in this episode, he gets into a lot of detail about the ways that he goes about doing that, whether it's using certain pieces of outboard gear to impart its own character, or whether it's being creative with plugins and specific plugins that he really enjoys that give an analog sound. So he gets into all of that kind of stuff in today's episode. So if you're trying to chase the analog sound and you know you think your digital recordings maybe sound a little too stale or just don't have enough character to them i think you're going to really enjoy this episode because martin gets into a lot of detail in terms of what he's using specifically so definitely very helpful there and another really big part of martin's sound that at least i really appreciate and enjoy is his drum tones and we also get really deep into what he does to make drum sound exciting in his mixes And he's a drummer, too, so he obviously has put a lot of thought into the sounds that he's chasing and how to get them. So, again, he gets into a lot of detail about all that kind of stuff as well. So with that said, let's just jump right into this episode, because I think you're going to really enjoy it and find a lot of this very, very helpful. Martin Cook, thank you so much for being on the Master Your Mix podcast. How's it going, man? I am good. How are you? Doing great. For people who might not know you or your background or even what you do, can you give us a little bit of that background, who who you are, what you do, and ultimately how you got into music production? Yeah, um, I guess I'm a engineer, mixer, sometime producer. Um, I mostly focus on mixing engineering. Um, I've been in LA for 17 years, 16 years, almost 17 years. Um, I came up through Henson Studios. I was a runner and staff engineer over six years. And then uh, I went to go work with um, Rich Costi, who I worked for for about five years as a mix assistant and uh, engineer. Um, And then I've been independent since then, which was about 2018. That's awesome. How did you get started with like music production to begin with? Like, were you a musician yourself or, you know, what what led you to this? It, it, It was kind of a route through school. I went to, I originally, I started in, I'm from Houston, so I started school at the University of Houston studying music education, um, because that was just kind of what you did if you wanted a music track and you were in high school band. Um, I mean, I played in bands in high school, but I was actually interested, I'm a a drummer, but I was majoring in percussion, so I was actually interested in um, that route, and then I kind of quickly realized that it kind of, it just didn't naturally come to me, um, the, uh, like performance aspect of it um i I would have to like spend a lot of time in a practice room to kind of get or like my friends i could just see them like naturally doing it and it kind of flipped some switches for me Mm -hmm. um so i I, but i was really into arranging and things like that and i eventually decided that that i wanted to try a film score major which is what led me to going to berkeley and boston and then when i got there you, you know it's like you take all these basic music technology classes and that got me really interested because I've always been kind of a computer nerd and into those kind of things. Um, and that led me into basic recording classes and that kind of just unfolded. And I ended up doing a dual major in music production and in music synthesis, which is more like sound design and, cool. you know, that world. Um, which I don't do as much any of that these days, but I'm glad I, I have those skill sets and that knowledge because it's, nice to know what you know filters and envelopes and oscillator what all those do and how you can use them because yeah, it can be sure. you know very useful and um when it comes to shaping audio for sure no that's that's an interesting thing and like i think sound design is one of those fields that a lot of people don't even realize is a be a career choice you know it's like they, yeah. they think you have to be either in a studio recording music or like scoring something but they don't realize that like all those other sounds that are in a in the back of a film those are all super important and somebody's yeah, making I mean, them 
when I first moved to LA, my original plan was like, oh, I'll work in a studio on the, you know, Monday through Friday and I'll do like sound design gigs on the weekends, you know, or like as like a side gig. Mm-hmm. And that, that just never happened because I never left the studio. It was just constantly <laughs> there for like three months. So, yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah. fun, you know, like I, every once in a while, it's a good skill to have. And like, I have a couple friends that do it. They do a lot of like trailers and film scores and stuff. And, Every once in a while, I get to do sessions with them, just re- recording whatever vocalists or things. Yeah, it's yeah. just kind of fun to see that world. It's very different, but um, you know, it's, it's very creative, which is cool. So, as far as like getting into the mixing side of things, um, were you learning that in school, or was that something that like you kind of developed more once you got into Henson? I mean, I think that like especially mixing, I think you can only like learn it by just doing it, like. You can, I think I think music production school or audio schools is, you know, I can only speak for Berkeley, but I assume other places, you know, I think it's good for understanding basic concepts like, you know, just the general base layer of what things are, how compressors work, what EQs do, you know, like the actual science behind it and like what it's actually doing. But as far as like building your skill set, I don't think there's any way to learn anything. Like being a recording engineer or a mixing engineer, even especially being a producer, like, you just have to do it. I mean, I, unfortunately, I think that's part of it. But, you know, if you have a background, if you have some kind of knowledge of how basic things work, it's obviously going to help you. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I think I learned more about mixing as a staff and engineer at Henson because I mix, I would assist for a bunch of people, you know. Um, mm-hmm. You know, people like Randy Staub and Brendan O'Brien and, you know, those, those like people that have been doing it for 20, 30 years. Yeah. Um, but at Henson, it was a lot of like just tracking too, like a lot of recording. Because when I got there, it was kind of the last big studio where we had like a full band in all four rooms every day, you know. Um, but when I worked for Rich, it was like that was a lot of mix. That was like mix with the masters every day kind of vibe. Because we did most of our year was like we would produce like one, maybe two projects a year, but most of it was mixing. Yeah. And it was a lot. We'd mix like three records at a time. It was just constant. Yeah. I imagine as a assistant, you know, at a big place like that, you're seeing new people coming through every single day. So, you know, you're having to adapt to multiple different styles or workflows and that kind of thing. Cause like, you know, each person has their own way of doing things. So it's not like if you, like I, I personally, like when I, when I started interning in studios, like I would shadow one person for like years at a time. So like I learned that workflow, you know, but I imagine to like, right. and that takes time to even pick up like how one person does it. Right. But then to, be in a room with like new people every day i'm sure you're just having to work real quick to like figure out okay this is how they do it this is how they set up their session it's a really good uh it's a really good way to know like how to deal with personalities um and how like when when you're needed to speak up and when you're not you know when they just want you to be a fly on the wall and yeah because one day you'd be doing a rock band the next day maybe you're doing a scoring session for a tv show and then the next day it's a a pop thing for a vocalist, you know, and there's not really much for you to do other than patch a vocal mic in. So I think a big part of like, I would consider places like Henson and big studios or I guess any kind of internship or runnership or whatever. It's almost like continuing an education. It's like mm-hmm. you're going to grad school. Um, Cause you're just absorbed. It's like, you know, you're when you're a doctor and you get your, um, what's that called? Your residency, you know, cause you're just absorbing information from people that have been doing it for a long time, but you're also working, you know, you're part of the process. You're not just sitting there taking notes. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it was wild. It, it would be, you know, day to day could be completely different. You know, luckily we had big projects that would come through. So sometimes you'd be on an album for like a couple months, mm-hmm. which is wild to think about these days. But um, yeah, it was great. I loved it. It was probably one of the best experiences I could ask for, you know, that's awesome. a place like that. Yeah. You know? And was it like more analog at that time or was it digital? I mean, we had Pro Tools rigs, yep. but it was like, I could tell you that like, I could probably on two hands count the amount of, amount of plugins they had. You know, it was like, <laughs> this is, we're talking about 2007. So it okay. was like, I don't know, probably only been like four or five years since like Pro Tools rigs were standardized, you know. Because mm-hmm. even before that, they were like renting them out from people or you'd have to, if you wanted a Pro Tools rig, there's still, at that time, there's still a 24 track in every room. Um, every room is, there's all SSLs there. So big SSL consoles. Okay. Um, you know, yeah, it was like every room basically pretty much had the same kind of gear layout. Um, 
So as you went from room to room, there was always eight eight racks, eight channels of Neve. You know, there's always three or four, you know, LA two E's living like everything was pretty much identical in every room. So you know, every room had a fair child, which is insane. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. And you just got spoiled, you got used to it. Yeah. Um but yeah, it was mostly analog. And like we still calibrated the Pro Tools rigs before every session. Like oh, wow. you would go in with a tech and you'd put up a tone and you would cal every output to minus eighteen or whatever the engineer that was like part of our information we'd have to ask the engineer. Like sample rate, you know, what do you want the rig cal to? You know, most people would say minus eighteen, but every once in a while someone would say minus sixteen because they want a little bit different, you know, headroom levels and things like that. And especially if you're mixing, you'd like cal the print rig or the print converter differently. Some people liked it at like minus twenty so they could mix really hot and not clip the converters and things like that. Um, so it was it was still analog kind of in that sense where and like nowadays it's like I don't even know how you calibrate if you don't have an HDIO, like how I don't I guess converters just don't sway anymore because they used to sway all the time. It was wild. You go in the next day and they'd be down like half a dB in different places. So you don't, I just stuff you don't think about. Yeah, it's anymore, not, not now, not even an issue anymore, right? It's like built yeah, into I mean, our it, stuff. <laughs> there's no, there's not pots on the back of my 24 channels of Apollo that I can adjust outputs on, you know? <laughs> so. so interesting. But you know, it, it's, it's kind of interesting that like, they had that set up at that studio where every room was the same. And, and to me, that makes the most sense. Like it, you know, it, it would make everyone's job there easier to quickly adapt to whoever comes in. And, you know, yeah. If, if it was different gear in every room, like you'd be just having to re rethink about everything every time. Right. Yeah. And, and essentially, cause all the consoles were older SSLs except studio a, which is a J. Um, but the, the SSLs in Studio B, Studio D, and the mix room were all, you know, G's or E series and had uh, G plus computers. So you could technically move room to room and recall the desk, you know, and you'd be, you know, obviously it's not going to sound exactly the same. They're all different eras of consoles, but you could be pretty close. Um, and yeah, obviously each piece of gear is not going to sound the same. But yeah, you could, you could, you knew what you had when you got in there. Um, and then we had a whole tech shop just full. Like there was like another like twenty something channels of Neve floating around. We had a BCM Tim that floated, and just tons of gear. Um, it'd be fun because you go in like big sessions, and the credenzas would just be stacked with <laughs> even more stuff. Uh, yeah, it was wild. It's a different era for sure, and I kind of miss it. Um, and it just you know it feels like a different lifetime almost. Yeah, it's just you know. There are very few bands that could afford to go to places like that anymore. But um, it's a treat when you get to go to some a place like that. Uh, For sure, it really is. Well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's fun to play with all the toys and have all like the physical knobs and everything. And you know, it's it, you feel like you're it's way more tactile, and and you know, people enjoy that. Yeah, especially if you're recording a band, there's nothing better than having a console in front of you because you can like the your flow is for me at least is so much quicker. Like you can have things set up on sins, you know. And easily get inspired. It's like, oh, that's that's a cool drum part. Let's send it to this delay we have, you know, on Sin One, and that can just be patched to an input, and you can record that while the drummer's playing it live, that they're hearing, and that's going to inspire them to play something different. Or, you know, I like to have a bunch of not a bunch, but a few like compressors set up on buses or sins if I can, you know, because like, oh, maybe we can smash this a bit harder, but you're not necessarily burning the entire drum kit to tape that way, you know. It's like, yeah. This is like a little spice we can add. Um, I have one of these overstayer stereo modular channels, which are these this kind of like awesome box, I guess is what I would call it. <laughs> you know, it's like EQ, insane, really cool compression, um, and there's like three different harmonic circuits. And if I can, I'll take that to a tracking session and just put it on a stereo send, and you can send anything to it, and it just sounds awesome. And you can really like manipulate things and tweak things and um it, it does a lot it's pretty cool yeah yeah so then when you were making that switch from like primarily working in an analog environment to the digital side of things um was that a fairly smooth thing for you or was it it was kind of a slow process like even when i worked for rich like we mixed on consoles like there was a little bit of a brief period where he was kind of uh experimenting with like summing mixers and stuff but we still had outboard gear and my studio is still hybrid like i still i still sum analog or yep. summing mixer and i still have you know inserts that i patch in but I, i'll just print them it's they rarely run, run live unless it's some kind of parallel dynamics thing but like 
I have a vocal chain, and once I kind of get it dialed, I'll just print it and recall the notes so that if someone wants it changed, I can change it, but it rarely, you know, mm-hmm. it's usually just kind of part of the sound. Um, it was more of like figuring out like um, what, how you can set up your DAW to do the things that analog would do and what you expect to hear, like working on a console or if you're used to mixing the tape or whatever. Like, and for me, it's a lot of like har- harmonic stuff. Like I have a ton of like tape emulations across, like I basically built like a virtual desk in Pro Tools with aux tracks. So I think of that as my console. And then the tracks in Pro Tools are the tape machine, right? Gotcha. Um, now, I still process the individual tracks, and that's where most of the automation happens. But, like, there's this kind of, like, almost, like, faders at zero set of aux tracks that are outputting to my actual summing mixer that are, like, you know, this does what I think, like, outputting to a console would kind of do. So there's, like, gotcha. tape on there, and there's harmonic stuff through different plugins. And yeah, For yeah. me, that's just what I figured out. Yeah. No, it makes sense. And, like, yeah, if you're familiar with that workflow, then... Yeah, treat your your digital sessions the same way, and you should be able to get a similar result. Um, do you do you find that like are you are you the kind of person that will just like put like all you know SSL G's or E's or whatever across every channel kind of thing just to give you that console kind of vibe as well? well? I, I do that on my out like my output buses or the console thing okay. I'm talking about, and I use the the um the um Brainworks one, the um the plugin alliance ones. Yeah, because they 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 model large format consoles with separate channels so you can actually have each instance have its own characteristic yeah and it's really cool because you can put a bunch of them on those channels and there's a button where you can just randomize which channel it was modeling and it'll apply to all of them and you can literally sit there and just cycle that and your mix will change like certain like things will pop (laughs) pop forward and you know because the it's basically phase differences right that's Mm -hmm. really what it is when you come out like you have an SSL with identical channels. They're not all exactly the same because they're each com- there's so many components in there that some of them, you know, some caps are a little bit more burned out than others, and that changes all these subtle things. Which analog is just like changing phase relationships, really, when it comes down to it. Because you're like, you're anything that goes to an analog circuit is some kind of filter, you know, whether it's a transformer or an actual filter an EQ. Like there's something happening, and that just changes every tiny aspect. Um, and for me, that's like my summing mixer has transformers on it. My print back converter has transformers on it. Like as much as that as I can add into the mix makes me feel like there's more, you know, depth or what, whatever, mm-hmm. all those dumb generic terms that people talk about. But to me, it's just more familiar to what I like to hear, you know? Yeah, no, that makes sense. And, and I think you bring up a really good point with the phase thing, because I think that's something a lot of people who have never worked in analog understand, you know, like, it's just in digital, everything's all the same. So you just kind of expect that it sounds that way. And, you know, most plugins don't have that emulation that like the, those Brainworks ones have. Um, so they're used to every channel strip sounding exactly the same. So, yeah. you know, having these little phase differential things in, in the in the plugins, it it's su- it's super subtle. And most people might not even notice it, but it it's adding something to your track that is giving it some of that analog character. And, and most yeah. people, I think, also just probably don't even look at that that analog modeling section of those plugins, and you know, they probably just leave it so it's like you know, channel one and two or whatever the default is, right? Yeah, <laughs> and it's cool because you can set it to be like st- what they call like stereo digital or analog, or sorry, a- stereo digital or stereo analog. To where like if it's stereo digital, like both sides, if it's a stereo channel, are like identical, so there's no messing up the left to right. Or you can leave an analog mode where it's like left is channel one, right is channel two, you know, the next pair is three and four, that kind of thing. So if you do have something that you want the like left and right to be identically processed, you know, they'll do it that way. Because obviously like if you have a stereo track in Pro Tools where you have one instance of an SSL plugin, like in a real world, you would have to have two channels, right? Mm -hmm. Channel one and channel two or whatever. And those would be slightly different, which then would make it feel more wide possibly, you know. Um, Yeah. But yeah, it's, I don't know. It's and the other thing too is like it depends on the type of music you're making too, right? Like, not everything calls for. I mean, I, I I think I predominantly work with like bands, you know, with like guitars and drums and things like that. So there's more live recording and just what I do in general. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you do, you know, if you're a pop producer, a lot of times, you know, that stuff just doesn't even like come into effect. But um, it's crazy what a little bit of like air, like air moving in a room through a microphone, can do to add. 
the sounds because your brain is expects that right sure like that's what you you're you're just kind of there's like sixty thousand years of evolution of us hearing sounds through the air so like that's kind of like something that tr- triggers us somehow um, at least i think so so when you get you know, i did a session last month an album i've been working on mostly all programmed you know guitars are recorded live obviously vocals but you know most of the sounds are kind of in the boxes that's just kind of what we're working with um and we added like some horns and we added a live drummer to tracks and it's just like instantly it's like the, the drums are just like additive they're not even the main parts you know and the horns are just kind of background but like hearing live instruments in a room it just does it like just puts this like big kind of hug around the rest of the music and like brings it into this like real world for a minute um just some weird psychoacoustic stuff but it's fun and it sounds yeah yeah do you, and do you think that that's like something that people can replicate with like reverbs and stuff like that or is it really just a matter of like tracking i mean you, i think to a certain extent i mean like alter verbs really good at that um that's funny i was just walking down the street and there's a couple of my studio friends that have rooms in the building i'm in and they're mostly writers but they're like man what do you do for like live drum programming I was like, I don't, I just record drums, you know, like, <laughs> he's like, I just can't get them to sound right. And I was like, yeah, cause they're all like gacked up and, you know, they're already like super processed and they don't have any relation to what you're doing yet. But, um, and I, I just find, I find like programming drums just to be like, as a drummer myself, I find it super hard. Cause it's like, you have to really understand the mechanics of a drummer to make it sound believable and real. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm also, you know, well, as I mentioned, I'm a drummer and like, I think that's one of my strong suits is like, I, but I really program acoustic drums. Unless it's as a complete demo, of, you know, that will eventually replace. But non-acoustic drums I love because it's just sound and you're doing, you know, you're just doing stuff that relates to, you know, everything else in the track. Um, or if there's already a drum part, you know, adding to it or whatever. But acoustic drums are tough because it's like, here's addictive drum or superior drummer. And you're like, cool, I have this like super EQ'd compressed drum set that sounds like cool on its own, but it has no relation to what, I'm doing, you know. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, if you're in a room with a band, like, the drummer's going to play a certain way depending on how this, you know, the singer is singing the song. Yeah, for but sure. Obviously, there's good ones out there, and I love addictive. I use it all the time, but uh, it's hard to kind of like start with that. For sure, you know. And I think that's part of the problem with a lot of those like drum programs is that they have already been processed because that's the only way to make them sound exciting. Like, kind of raw drums sound pretty boring. Dude, well, yeah, you put up mics on drums and you don't do much to them they're not that exciting really unless it's like a beautiful stereo mic in a room with an insane drummer an insanely tuned kit you know that just sounds great in the room but like if you're making a rock record or a pop record like you kind of have to do stuff to those you know they don't just like (laughs) it's not like you put a jcm and a 4x12 up and you put a 57 on it kind of just sounds awesome because it's all there already you know Mm -hmm. you don't really do much to that but uh, yeah, drums you kind of you have to work for, like, but but I, yeah, the whole thing of like they've got to sound finished or no one's gonna buy them, you know. It's it's exactly that, right? Yeah. It's part of the marketing process is like make these things sound hyper realistic, and and then people are like, okay, great, this is done. I don't need to do any work. I wish there was a, like on those like plugins, there was a way to like just one button where you turn off like most of the like turn off all the compression and the crazy reverbs and just give me like basic kind of starting point because i find when i use those a lot i'm like oh this i like the tone of that drum but it's like way too compressed for what i'm doing so then you got to go in and figure out how to turn off like all the you know inserts they have within their own little modules and that just is annoying yeah and i think it's also skewing with people's perceptions of what actual drums sound like you know like people just learn that like things have this like hyper real sound and they just expect that real drums sound like that and if they're trying to record them themselves and they hear what a raw drum, drum kit sounds like and they're like oh this sounds like crap like i'm just gonna load up a million samples you know <laughs> it's like yeah you know it, people are people are just taking the easy route drums are like so complex in the recording process because you have a you have the most mics on things you know um i mean obviously you can do a one mic recording and that works but generally you know we're putting like six to ten mics on a drum kit you know so you have all these phase issues and it's just like you don't listen to drums like that naturally like you listen to the room, it's so like really what you're hearing. And like when you listen to a guitar player, you know you put a mic a foot away from him, it's generally going to sound like sitting in front of an acoustic guitar player listening to him play. Uh, same with an electric guitar. You you know, obviously having a bit of room tone in an electric guitar helps as well. 
but drums, it's like you don't ever listen to naturally to drums like that. Like you're standing in front of a drum kit and you're like, wow, this sounds great. And then you go in the control room and you're like, it doesn't sound anything like that. It's because your your ears are picking up an infinite amount of reflections off of everything. And it, it that's what drums sound like. They don't sound like a mic on the snare and the kick, you know. So it's, yeah, it's difficult to like trick your brain that this is the same thing out there. <laughs> totally. But you need it because you need it to be punchy and you need to be able to, you know, push those things in a mix. And of course, you can't really do that with like a stereo room mic. Of course. Well, even when you just listen to close mics, like close mics don't sound like drums either. Like they're no, cause it's like you're like, have you ever put your ear next to a snare drum and like had some? It doesn't sound good. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not what you're supposed to. That's not how it's supposed to sound. Yeah, you're right. It's it's so much more of the room that you're hearing. Like you're hearing Absolutely. that like cacophony of sound just you know swirling in the room, and and that's what's giving you that that energy. Yeah, and then again, that's how like we have um, we have two omni microphones on our head. We don't have close mics. It's like. That was it's always a thing. We're like, man, that sounds good in the room, but it doesn't sound great in here. And it's like, well, why? Well, like, turn the room mics up. You know, or like, figure that kind of thing out. Like, um, yeah, it's surprisingly how many like I, I think what I think of like great drum sounds in like big ro- rock songs, or whatever, are so roomy because you need all that kind of cacophony to fill up the space, especially if there's like big guitars and things like that. But for sure, well, it makes sense that you're a drummer and you pay attention to like all of these little details and. And, you know, it's it's actually one of the things I really admire about a lot of the productions you do is like your drum sounds are incredible. I really, I really like what you do with them. Um, and, and I'm curious to dive a little bit more into that process of like, you know, getting those sounds. Obviously, you've talked about, you know, room mics being such a big part of that. Um, I've heard you also say before that parallel compression plays a big role in your drum sounds, too. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how that actually uh, how you use it in your mixes. Yeah, um, generally, if it's if it's something I'm producing and recording um like like i will i will record the drums like pretty normal you know i won't go nuts on anything individually as far as uh you know like kick mic snare mic that kind of stuff it's all pretty basic but like i said i I like to have something that i can work with while i'm tracking um even if it's just like a mono sin to an 1176 that i can kind of hammer a little bit like you blend that in like that's parallel from day one and it's in the analog domain there's no conversion phase stuff it's not going to a plug and in back it's like there and it just it's tight it feels good it helps the drummer play better uh, when it comes to mix though i you know i have a couple parallels i have like a stereo parallel that i set up that's usually um i really like the um the uad zener limiter by chandler um like i, I kind of like that sound it's kind of that british not ssle it's a little bit more kind of gooey i guess Mm-hmm. whatever that means um i'll use that and then i'll usually have a mono compressor as well like an, an 1176 uad kind of thing um and i kind of like blend those use those to taste um usually it's like a pretty uh pretty like fast attack slow release thing where it's just kind of creating this like wall of drum that you then you can mix in against everything else um so like kind of create like a more of like a pumping kind of effect not so much unless uh, I'll, I'll unless like that's specifically what i want it to do um it's more it's actually kind of more the opposite where it's just kind of like the compression hits and holds so you get this just kind of sus- it's more sustain without the like constant gotcha. attack yeah, yeah. um but i do i mean who doesn't like a good pumping that would be more like on the mono thing because you can generally handle the kick and snare a bit better um or sometimes if I really want to pump, I'll do, you know, like side chain a compressor on the room mics or something like that. If yeah. you want to get that effect. Um, this is more just like, it's like a thickening. It's like cornstarch. You just kind of, it kind of helps support the drums um, in between the notes, especially if you don't have a great room sound, you know, uh, it'll just kind of fill those gaps a bit if you need it to. Uh, but, it, you know, it can be difficult if you have like sloppy open hi-hats because that'll just like eat up all the, energy and for sure i don't know i have them there and it's just kind of like i generally always send it to my stereo impression and it's just kind of a louderizer thing gotcha so what exactly are you sending to like are those you said you have their stereo and then your mono are you sending all of the drums to to those Um, or just certain elements just kind of whatever works i always usually generally kick snare and toms Um, just like the shells kind of thing yeah and then like Depending again, like the, what the symbols are doing, um, 
I'll either send the overheads or the rooms or whatever I, you know, if there's like a, maybe it's just a mono mic or, um, it just, it really depends. Like, and what's nice about having those on sends is I can send like, I'll usually send full signal, you know, zero DB, kick and snare and the toms I can mix in and you can mix in a little bit of whatever you want. Or maybe you push the, the rooms on a course or whatever so that it's the whole thing just kind of juices up a bit. Um, mm-hmm. But it's usually always, yeah, the shells and then whatever symbols work, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, it makes um, sense. It just depends if someone's playing closed hat or if they're just wailing on a crash symbol. That's a good point. Yeah, because I think a yeah. lot of people, I, I, I see people like constantly just sending everything to the to those buses because they figure that's what they should be doing. But it, you have to be careful with the symbols because, yeah, you get those like open hi-hats where things are just like swelling or just like it's yeah. creating so much more noise in your mix and makes it so much harder to work with after. Yeah, and it depends also on like the, the symbols used in the drummer. I mean, you can have someone wail on a, on a good, like, on a symbol that sounds nice and you can make it work, you know, that's, it's not like an impossible thing to do. Um, and it, it just kind of goes back to how well the drums are recorded and tuned and all that, kind of thing, which is such a big part of, when you can like, <laughs> when you can mix songs that were recorded well and recorded with good instruments with good players, it makes everything just so much easier because you're just, you're not sitting there trying to figure out how to fix problems you're just and then they're trying to make this better you know yeah you're just enhancing yeah. yeah yeah for sure well like one thing about your drum sounds that i've always really liked is that they tend to have like a really like kind of fat down tuned i want to say dry but i know you were just talking about how like you love leaning into like room mics but they kind of have this like tighter kind of sound to them in general i find um especially with like stairs um but you do a really great job of like making that tighter kind of drier sound still poke through in a mix, you know, as opposed to like it just feeling dull, you know. Um, so I'm curious to know, like, do you have any tips for getting those kind of dry, tighter sounds to to cut through in a mix? Um, I think, I, well, I think a lot of times people can over compress close mic stuff like kicks and snares to get them punchy, and then they just like usually it's a, a too fast of an attack, and you hear it do that thing where it just kind of goes like you know knocks it down. Um, I mean, I almost generally always have like, if I'm using the SSL channel, I just will leave it on like fast release, so it's just kind of doing its normal thing, um, and that's just something coming f- up from working on those consoles that I'm used to. But I think parallel is really helpful because you're not killing the entire sound; you're still getting the attack of the drum, and you're just kind of supporting it in that way. Um, obviously, saturation helps a ton. I usually have some kind of saturation over like the entire drum sound. Um, like uh, I really like that Fab Filter Saturn is really good. Even That's just like cool. on the default setting, like it just sounds kind of awesome. You can do pretty cool things with that, especially because it's multi-band. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't know. I mean, also you know, blending in samples doesn't hurt, and I'm, I'm not a, a you know opposed to doing that. Um, but it, it depends on the artist, you know. If yeah, for like, sure. If it if it requires it, you know. There's a lot of, I'm trying to think of some examples. Uh, like there's a band called Ultra Q that I've done some work with from um, Oakland. And on there it's, it's more kind of like indie rock, kind of like um, early 2000s stuff. So there's a lot of like live drums that we did, but we had put a bunch of programming underneath it to kind of create this weird, you know, kind of block party kind of vibes, um, which is really cool. Um, cool. But if it's like a rock band, I don't tend I don't really tend to use that many samples unless it just needs it. Yeah. But um I don't know. I think I think understanding compression can help you get those drier things forward. And a lot of it's just like playing with attack and release times. Because those have to do with those are relative to the song, the tempo of the song, right? And like if you can get those timed correctly so it feels natural in the song, then it usually a lot of that stuff will help. Um if, you know, if your release is too slow, then the sustain of your drum will just hang over longer. If you can time it so that it kind of pushes and pulls with the tempo, um, then that'll make it feel just more, you know, in time and uh, it's punctual. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of things you just brought up there that I think are all worth covering. Like, so you talked about how, you know, getting that um, dry sound is still punched through. You said a lot of it has to do with the parallel stuff. Do you find yourself often like actually compressing individual channels or do you tend to leave those a little bit more raw and just lean on the parallel side? 
I'll still compress individual channels, but I'll but not as drastically as it would as a parallel process, you know. Gotcha. Um and when you say drastic, like what kind of what kind of like reduction are we talking about here? Cuz everyone has a different opinion of what that could be. <laughs> well, I think it's I mean, I would say there's less I don't I couldn't tell you Okay. like numbers, but I can tell you that it sounds crazy, you know? Like I mean like Gotcha. You know, like I'm I'm not going to compress the snare individually and so it's just going like whir, whir, you know, it's it's going nuts. Yeah. Unless unless it calls for it, but it really does. But I'll do that to like a parallel channel and make it just kind of crazy sounding, like really fast attack or really slow attack, fast release, and get a pump or whatever and bring that in. Because then you have control over like the chaos and what's not chaos. Mm-hmm. Um, or is if, you know, everything's chaos, then it's a bit harder to do that. But I will compress individual channels, yeah. Because sometimes you need dynamic control, like you know, use a compressor like it's supposed to be used for <laughs> dynamic control and not for creating destruction. But, um, you know, I won't over compress individual channels again unless it's I need it for an effect. But I think most of the stuff that kind of creates a sound will be in the parallel side. Um, but like, I almost have, I have one of those SSL channels on almost every drum track. Just because, again, I'm like the EQ, I know how to use it, I know how to use the compressor. I think that, I think that Brainworks one sounds really good too and it, feels like I'm working on a console a bit, especially the EQs, more so than any other ones, in my opinion. But um, yeah, I mean, I'll still do that. It's just, I try not to overdo it at the source, but I can overdo it somewhere else. Gotcha. That makes sense. It's almost like you're, you're kind of like leaning into your parallel stuff just to like excite the room sound a little bit more and bring out more of that. Yeah, like if I were to mute all the kind of extra stuff and just listen to the plain drums, it would sound like a nice playing drum kit which may be totally fine for something but you know usually you want it to be a bit more exciting and weird or whatever but um another good one is like devil lock is great to use yeah very very mildly like if you put that thing on and leave it even in like default but with a fast release and then just like i usually like to darken it with the darken knob a bit and then just mix in i'm I'm not even kidding like one or two percent yeah, I find the same thing. Anytime you go past one, it just becomes like chaos. <laughs> yeah, and I love that thing. But like, if you just do that kind of thing over all the drums, like you're kind of master drum bus, that thing adds so much kind of weight and punch to it because it is so aggressive. And with like a little, it's just crazy because that one percent, it's that it can't be one percent. I don't know, you know, how you what the actual, <laughs> you know, but whatever it says on the knob, like a lot of times, yeah, I rarely have it above two percent, and it just does a thing because it does add this like dark coloring that when you add that in to the, your kind of already normal drums it helps kind of support everything that's a fun one to use a lot sure well you also talked about samples and it sounded like you kind of you're open to using samples but it's not something you try to you know you try to get a good sound without relying on the sample um yeah, yeah. how like in terms of the samples that you typically find yourself using like is there a typical sound to those like do you do you typically lean towards ones that are like Know, maybe different tuning or like maybe more attack or that kind of thing yeah i mean i think it's kind of like what does the drum set need if we're talking about acoustic drums if it's something i didn't record or maybe something that we recorded in like later on you're like no this isn't really holding up to like where we've gotten with the song um if it's like you know the kick needs more depth to it then i'll find a kick sample you know i probably only have like four kicks and four snares that i actually ever use and they all kind of do different things. Like one's more tone, one's more attack, you know. And it's just like, what do you need out of, what do you need to get what the sound that you want? Like what's missing? Um, a lot of times if it's stuff I'm mixing that other people have recorded, then it's like, oh, like there's no top end of the snare. It's just just kind of a dull 57. It's like, okay, well, I'll add something that has a bit more brightness. Or maybe there's no bottom mic and we need more of that kind of under snare sound then i'll have a sample that kind of does that but it's really just that it's not like i use the same kick every single time you know yeah. and sometimes like you can also you can remedy things by like duplicating tracks and doing some crazy filtering or eqing to kind of bring those things out but and then the other side is like adding something synthetic where you're like oh i want this kick to have a weird like 909 sound but with the you know so maybe i'll just mute the kick mic Mm-hmm. And we'll program a 909 in and like, or whatever, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll put in something kind of crazy and like the whole rest of the drums are acoustic except the kick drum. So it can just be like 
gotcha. spanking in your face and not mess with anything else, which is kind of a fun thing to do. Yeah, it's cool. Um, there's a record I worked on with Rich, and he had just bought a Fairlight, and we were messing with the Fairlight, which is a whole like process because that thing was like the most archaic sequencer there is, basically. But um, we like I programmed this kick pattern for a song, and we loved the way it sounded. So we had the drummer play the part, but no kick drum. Like not even he recorded it and we muted it. He just didn't play it. <laughs> so I think we, I think we just took his kick drum out. So he could still hit the pedal. It was just really funny because there was this like crazy Fairlight kick drum sound happening and then this drummer playing on top of it and it was a pretty wild drum sound, but it was pretty cool. That's cool. Yeah, I love hearing people talk about like blending like all sorts of different sounds together and I, it, it, it may make sense. It's just like it's adding a different texture and it's, you know, it's making something unique. I mean, that's kind of modern production. Like, you know, if you're doing something, at least in the last probably 10, 15 years, you're probably going to have some kind of sample in there. I mean, yeah. I think that's kind of the way it is these days, which is fine. I mean, who yeah. cares? If it sounds cool, it sounds cool. Cool. Yeah, I agree. And I imagine, like, even with your sound design background, too, like, you're probably used to just, like, you know, creating creating new things out of, you know, layers and all sorts of stuff. So, you know, kind of maybe brings you back to that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's fun to, like, like I said, like, like sometimes I'll remedy things by duping tracks. Whereas, like, you know, this kick doesn't have enough sub. I was like, well, let me dupe the sub and I'll filter everything out, you know, above. 100 hertz and then put like a resonant filter down there and try to find the fundamental it's like oh cool now i have a sub kick mic that wasn't there before yeah no That's you cool. can do stuff like that um as well if you're like trying to find something that's you know maybe you can't quite find a sample that's the same pitch because that's a big thing people bring in drum samples that are just completely different pitches and or the phase is not quite good enough and it makes actually makes the drum sound worse Sample sounds good on its own, but with the kit, you know, it doesn't sound great. So, but then you get into phase issues when you're filtering yeah. that heavily. But, you know, do you ever use any of those, like, um, like what is it, like auto align or whatever, like that, that try to adjust the phase for you? I used to, I think years ago, I had auto align. And whenever I would get like what I considered a poorly recorded drum sound, I would use it. But it's just kind of like, I don't know. I felt like you could hear it a bit. You know, you could hear the like, it's stretching and pulling things a bit too much. Um, I, I haven't used it in years. I used to, but I kind of just like, if someone records a drum set poorly, and it, I just try to go with that and be like, all right, this is supposed to be kind of weird and bad sounding. You know, like, it's supposed to be kind of messed up and just kind of roll with that. Like, if they really yeah. wanted a pristine drum kit, then they would have done that, you know. True. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to, there's no way also I can make, a bad drum kit recording sound like it was something that Bob Clare Mountain recorded, you know, in for sure. <laughs> a nice studio. It's like, yeah, it's, it's not going to happen. Yeah, you basically have to re-record it at that point. There's no yeah, other way I've, around And it. I've told yeah. people that before. They'll be like, we want to sound like this. I'm like, well, you should have used different drums or like, like we like this, this kind of Tom thing. I'm like, oh, well, you should have used bigger Toms because these are not those, like, I can't change the fundamental sound of the instrument, you know, unless we just replace it kind of thing. So, of course, it happens, but you know. Yeah. Speaking of uh, drum recording, I was uh, I was checking out your Instagram and I saw one post that uh, showed you, you seem to be a fan of using the uh, well Sylvia Massey calls it the crotch mic. I don't know. If oh, yeah. <laughs> that's and, what I call it. There you call it that as well. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, for our for our audience who might not know like what that is, can you explain what that is and and how you actually use it and and kind of what you're going for with that kind of mic position? Yeah, I mean it's pretty self explanatory. It's a mic that's usually pointed at the drummer's crotch, and it usually it can kind of in that general area, it can kind of go. I usually I tend to put it kind of over the uh, batter side hoop of the bass drum, kind of pointing down ish towards the beater. Um, and that's kind of like a classic one mic position. Like if if you only had one mic, you can put like an omni mic there or a bi directional, and then angle it off the cymbals if you don't want. And you know if the drummer plays balanced and well, you can get a pretty decent one mic sound there. But I like to use it as just like kind of a it's more attack for me. Um, and do you use it as a as a cardioid then to get that attack or like to like direct? Yeah, it usually something? I will. Okay. Usually I will. Um, you can, I mean, you can kind of put anything there, and I'll usually blow it up a bit. Like if I'm on a console where like if it's a Neve and I can crank the prees, and it works. If there's not too much symbol, just to get a bit of crunch on it, or maybe just go through like an eleven seven six or distressor, something to kind of give it a bit of pump. Um, Generally, when I go to a studio that I've never been in before, I try to find a mic I've never used and try that out. 
um, which is fun. But like what you know, sometimes like Bayer 160s work great because they're hypercardioid ribbons. So you don't they're, they're quite nice. They will reject everything behind you. Um, 57s always work. Um, they they kind of came from a technique when I used to assist Brendan O'Brien and his, and he would do this thing called the kick snare, which was a 414 in bi-directional that they would put like this was the batter bass drum head and this is the bottom of the snare he would put it kind of like right here kind of like below the snare but like close to the kick beater yeah so you're and it would kind of angle it a little bit so you're getting like one of the capsules is getting like the beater and the other capsule is getting like bottom snare and then they would run that through a adr vocal stressor and just like crush the piss out of it and it was cool you got this like really cool sustain and really a lot of attack but it wasn't too much weight you know it was like it was all like kind of just in your face filler but you have to have a vocal stressor to make it work like in my opinion i've tried it with distressors and 11 and sixes and like the vocal stressor just does its insane thing in a certain way and, and then the eq because you can kind of carve it. it's just the thing that him and his engineers would use and uh mine just kind of turned into the crotch mic thing because everyone does the crotch it's just it's just it's an effect for me you know most of the time it's more attack on the kick and snare but then you can you know i don't know put a delay pedal on it and you can get cool yeah. weird stuff out of it do you do do you sit it like above the snare then to get the attack of the snare because i would assume if you had it any lower you might be just getting more of like almost like the side of the shell you know it's probably closer to a side shell position but more than anything i kind of point it down like towards the beater so you're maybe even getting just a little bit of like side slash bottom gotcha uh snare um it's not pretty to listen to it never is <laughs> like it's pretty obnoxious but it's amazing what it does when you blend it in and especially when you get it in the right phase position with the kicks and the snare mics like it really will bolster the attack quite a bit um and if you can use something that's hypercardioid and if you have to, if you're worried about cymbals and not get cymbal you know spill um I've never really tried to condense her down there. Just as I feel like it's a that's a lot of SPL, but I guess you could probably find something that has higher threshold or maybe put a pad on it or whatever. But usually yeah. dynamics or ribbons are pretty good. That's very cool. Yeah, it's something that I've I've seen a few people do, but I've never done it myself. So I'm always interested in, you know, what what, what people are using it for and you know, it's how... super fun. Cause if you can get the like I said, if you can get the phase right, sometimes you can add this like weird octave to the kick drum that is not getting, you know there to the the close mics because there's some you know resonance that's maybe bouncing off the back wall or something yeah you're kind of hearing it more from like the drummer's perspective as opposed to the person in front of the kit yeah yeah definitely yeah. it's definitely something you wouldn't hear naturally for sure it would yeah. be pretty wild to stick your head right there and listen to a drummer play <laughs> it's interesting because I, I do find that like some drum kits some kits sound different from behind them, you know, like they're. And, oh, yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. And for, yeah. like how they are, but from like actually behind the kit and how they are under the mic or in front, like there's there's so many different sounds you can get just based on positioning. So, yeah, um, especially if you're in like backed in a corner, like you're going to have like that's always the my, the most fun place to record drums is then being backed in a corner because you've got all that, you know, resonance. And like there was at Studio D at Henson, there's like a spot kind of by the big mic panel in the um, live room where there's just like this bottom end buildup. And sometimes we just throw like a 47 FET in that corner and you would get this like sub sound. It's like all the bottom end just collected in that corner and kind of hung out and didn't go back in the room like it was supposed to. And it was just a cool, you know, even if you had a bass amp in the room, you could throw that over there and you would get these crazy subtones. But yeah, I mean, I always like, if I'm in a new studio, the first thing I do is, I ask the assistant where the drums sound cool and then we set them up and then I have a drummer play and just walk around the room and you go, okay, this sounds cool. Like the, you figure out where the nulls are, where the peaks are and the, especially in the bottom end. Cause I like to, you know, I want to know like where you're placing your room mics. If there's no bottom end or if there's a ton of bottom end, depending on what you want. But walking around is such a big thing cause you take two steps and like everything changes. Um, not so much in a, like a really balanced room, but yeah, that makes a, that makes a lot of sense. So when you're when you're looking for that sweet spot with your room mics, are you trying to find the sound like the spot that has all that low end, or if I want it, I'm generally trying to find some sounds like it feels pretty even across the board. But if you walk into a corner and it's just like got this insane sound, you're like, oh, this is cool. Maybe we'll throw a mic up here just to have it, kind of thing. But I think generally you're looking for something that's pretty even. Yeah, because um, as you walk away from a kit, you'll just hear. Like, it'll be like this weird, there'll be like a bell curve that kind of 
a dip that kind of like moves with you depending on where you are and what the room's doing. Yep. Um, yeah, there's just so many aspects to drums. Like the, they, they, call, they push the most air in the most directions with the most amount of frequencies. You know, they're like all over the place. For sure. Dude, I could pick your brain about stuff all day long with this. <laughs> like, you know, I love I love your approach to drums, and I'm sure it's probably just as detailed and deep when it comes to like guitars and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, but I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Um, but one thing I, I do want to ask is like when it comes to ultimately creating a great mix, like, obviously we just focus so much on drums here, but like when you, when we're taking that step back and we're looking at how everything else in the mix comes together, um, what in your opinion ultimately makes a great sounding mix? I just think if it moves you, you know, like, do you feel something? Are you translating the song to the listener appropriately? Like, if I get bored while I'm mixing, I'm like, this isn't good. Like, something's not right. And I, like, I need to be excited while, like, I'm working. I like to be excited. If I'm start bouncing my head, like, that's good, you know? I think in the end game, that's, that. really, I think that's what it is. And I don't know, I mean... I feel like as I get older, I say this more and more, but like that doesn't necessarily mean it sounds quote unquote good. You know, I think really realistically, you're trying to translate whatever the song is about to the listener, or if it's a film score, it's like whatever the scene is happening. Like you're trying to elicit emotional response. And I, and I think that that's the end game really. Um, obviously like you want it to sound, you want to be able to hear the things you want to hear and the balance needs to be what you want, what you think and what the artist thinks. Um, but I, I mean, there's plenty of like great records that don't sound good, you know, that I mm-hmm. love that I'm not like, oh, it's, it's, the, we, you know, the bottom end's all messed up or whatever. It's just like, but yeah, it makes me feel cool. It makes, makes me feel a certain way. And I mean, that's really what it's about. I know it's kind of a dumb answer and it doesn't do, no, like, but it's, cover it's any true. Te- technical stuff, but it, like the, in the end, the technical stuff really doesn't matter. You know, it's like there's people making records on their iPhones that are like getting people excited. So it's like, that's just as valid as going and mixing in a multi-million yeah. dollar studio, you know? I love that. No, and it's so true. And it's funny. It's like, I feel like, you know, I, I'm now almost like 150 episodes deep in this podcast. And I feel like forever, everyone was just like, yeah, you got to make Paul sounding mixes and blah, blah, blah. And like the last like three or four episodes I've done, people have said like the complete opposite. Like, yeah, it doesn't need to sound perfect. Sometimes you need to make it sound worse. And I, and it's like, I kind of agree with that. You know, <laughs> like some of my favorite records have that chaos and they're not perfect and there's a vibe to them and it's something unique. And, uh, well, it's like all the, er- like l- listen to early strokes records. Like hmm. they don't sound good. <laughs> I mean, like technically, <laughs> but they're fun to listen to because it's energy and chaos and like, you just get the vibe of what, you know, the band wants to get across instantly. Hmm. But, you know, you're not like, you wouldn't put that up for like best engineering at the Grammys because that's not what, you know, they're looking for or something like that. But yeah, re- records like that, I think they have so much character to them. Like, you know, even like at the drive-in or something like that, like those records are always like chaos, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's what makes them they're, sound great. Yeah. That band is very chaos. <laughs> yeah. You got to work with them, right? Yeah, that was uh, that was so much fun. I was actually talking to a friend about that the other day. Um, like those Cedric and Omar are just like a riot to be in the studio with. They're like probably the two funniest people I've ever met individually. And then when you put them together, it's just like it's almost you can't handle like the comedy that comes out of them. It's it's just <laughs> they're wacky dudes. So they're so much fun. That record was a lot of fun to make. Um, Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, dude, this has been a lot of fun. I've, I've loved learning more about your process here and, and, uh, I'll have to have you back and we can start digging into like some of your vocal and guitar stuff. But, um, for people who might want to learn more about you, follow you online, maybe even potentially work with you. What's the best way for them to do that? I mean, uh, my website is probably, that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, which is just mcook.net. Uh, and then, I mean, I'm on Instagram. I don't, you know, I'm not very good at social media stuff, so. I post stuff I work on in like pictures of my dog and that's about it. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, what's my th- handle? It's just my name, Martin Cook, but then there's two spaces between Martin and Cook, like, which I guess is underscores nowadays. But uh, yeah, I mean, easily, easy way to get a hold of me is through my website and then occasionally I'll post something on Instagram, but I'm not 
very exciting on social media. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, man. It, it, people, most of the people I interview and ask that question to, they're just like, I'm too busy for in, for Instagram or social media. I mean, so. I'm not too busy for it. I'm just like, I, it's just like, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not very good at advertising myself and I'm not very good at selling myself. So it's like, I don't like, I don't like to be in the, I don't need to have my face on someone's screen all day, every day, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> like, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Right on, man. Well, well, thanks again for, for doing this. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it's been awesome learning more about what you do and how you go about doing it. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. So that was my episode with Martin Cook. And I really enjoyed that. I loved learning about his approach to getting that analog sound in the digital environment. And I love how he leans really heavily on things like room mics or parallel processing. Um, and I thought it was also cool to hear him talk about using the Plugin Alliance SSL plugins as well and how he likes to use the, uh, I believe they call it the THD, the Total total Harmonic Distortion, I think they call it. Um, Anyway, I love how he talked about using that in their plugins and how he uses that to help simulate that analog sound as well. I think that's a very small detail that can really go a long way in terms of yeah, getting that analog sound and something that is a little different and something that, you know, doesn't sound like the same digital plugins all the time, right? So yeah, I love learning about that. And also as a drummer, I love nerding out about drum stuff. So always fun to hear about his process for drums. And, you know, I thought it was really interesting to hear about some of the different mic techniques that he likes to use too, right? Like that that crotch mic technique or the Brendan O'Brien kick snare mic technique and how he uses compression with that. Definitely some fun new stuff to try out and I think will help to make some more interesting sounding drums. So next time you go to record some stuff, definitely experiment with some of these techniques and see what results you get for yourself. Now, that said, if you are currently recording your own records or mixing your own records and you're having trouble getting the sounds that you're ultimately chasing, you know, maybe you're not quite nailing the drum sound that you want or the guitar tone or your vocal tone or whatever, or maybe your mix is just kind of not sounding nearly as good as your favorite records. Well, if you would like some help with that, then I would love to help you out. Inside of my coaching program, Amplitude, I work one-on-one with my coaching students to help get their mixes sounding just as good as their favorite records. And inside of that program, there is a whole bunch of training, but you get one-on-one personalized feedback along the way with your mixes. You're getting actual actionable notes on what to do with your mixes to improve them. And we work back and forth on your tracks until your mixes are done and sounding amazing. This isn't some sort of thing where you just get like a weekly group call where you get five minutes of my time. No, instead, I work with you daily and go back and forth with you on your mixes to help you get your song sounding the way you need them to. And we cover the workflow, the tools, the processes. You get all the coaching along the way to help make sure that you get the results you're after. So if you're interested in getting help and you would love to learn more, make sure to visit MasterYourMix.com forward slash Amplitude. And you can find all the details there. And I'd love to show you a demo of the program so you can get a sense of what it's like to work with me in there. And I would love to help you out and ultimately help you finish your projects, make them sound great, be proud of the work that you make, and ultimately release those songs. So again, if you're interested, make sure to check that out, masteryourmix.com forward slash Amplitude. So that's it for this episode. We've reached the end. Thank you so much for sticking around. And I can't wait to chat with you in the next one. Talk soon. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at MasterYourMix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com.